Hello and welcome to the Argyle CX UX for B2B Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of this session. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Andrew Lindsay, Head of Enterprise Design and User Experience at Kraft Heinz. We're excited to have Andrew and our panelists with us for a panel titled, retaining and engaging B2B customers. Welcome, Andrew, and over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Very excited to be here. Uh, we have an amazing panel with us today who will be sharing their unique insights into the role that a well-crafted customer and user experience has when building out products and solutions for the B2B landscape. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, how the customer and user experience can be a critical make or break factor in how successfully your B2B customer relationships grow and scale over time. Before we jump in, I'd love to do a quick round of introductions to set the stage. Uh, Michael, would you mind kicking us, kicking us off? Sure, happy to. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, my name is Mike Boutanif. Um, I am, first of all, opinions are my own, uh, but I am uh, a integrated marketing strategy director at Silicon Valley Bank which you may not be familiar with if you're not a startup founder, an investor, or play in the innovation ecosystem, which is where we play. Uh, but I've been involved in um, architecting, designing, multi-channel, physical, and digital journeys throughout my career, 10 years in B2C, 10 years in B2B. Um, and before SVB, I was at MasterCard and IBM. So this is a, a topic that's close to my heart, really excited for it. Thanks, Andrew. Excellent, excellent. Um, Let's see, uh, Kristen, would you mind going next? Sure, thank you. So I'm Kristen Collins and I lead B2B client experience at Vanguard in our institutional division. So understanding and designing experiences for plan sponsors, for their retirement plans, for traditional institutional investors and for consultants. Uh, I've been in the marketing CX offer strategy space in financial services for over 20 years now, with the bulk of that actually being in the B2B space, about 15 years of it, um, whether it's financial advisors or today in the institutional realm. But excited to be here and, and dive into this topic with you all. Amazing, great to have you on the panel today. Uh, Candice, over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Candace Wallace. I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Relias, which is a healthcare technology company that provides SaaS solutions um, that really enable the healthcare workforce. Um, so I have a responsibility at Relias for all of our elements that are really post-sales, so customer success, services, support. Um, and responsibility for about you know 12,000 B2B customers and a few million active consumers across our, our consumer channels. So lots of focus on customer experience across each of those spaces and excited to chat with you all today. Fantastic. Vincent, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, Vincent Washington, uh, VP of CXM Best Practices with Sprinkler. Uh, Sprinkler is a, a SaaS company that offers uh, multitude of services to uh, brands on uh, improving and mapping out their CX experience. Uh, been in the IT space for over 20 years, working for brands like BlackBerry, uh, UPS, and Amazon, and uh, really excited to speak to everyone today. Awesome, awesome. So thank you all for being here today. Lastly, um, as Brittany mentioned, my name is Andrew Lindsay. I'm the head of enterprise design and user experience at Kraft Heinz. Right now, we're in the process of leveraging design as a competitive differentiator as we embark on the journey of digital transformation within and across the entire global org. So ultimately, we're positioning the design team to put the company at the forefront of the CPG industry in terms of how we're empowering teams to analyze and respond to changing market conditions across all sectors of the business. So we're doing this through real-time availability of data, insights, and guided actions, all of which, of course, wrapped up in an experience that our users love to interact with. So let's get started. Um, just to set the stage quickly, 
let's talk about some of the differences between CX and B2B and then CX into the direct-to-consumer space. Vincent, I would love to get your perspective on this. Yeah, I think with CX, um, again, it's really around what you, um, what your customers are saying about the business, the brand, and the experience. And um, the UX is really, or some of the differentiators is, is that with B2B uh, customers, it's really about retaining and engaging with them, but more so a, a long-term relationship rather than a, a short-term um, or shorter cycle relationship with customers. Interesting. So distilling it down to the highest level, brand on the customer experience, individual users at the user experience level. And if I could yeah. build on that, I think a big part of it too is often in the B2C space, you are interacting with that individual user, maybe a family. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest differences that I see in the B2B CX arena is oftentimes you are interacting with a complex ecosystem mm -hmm. of stakeholders, decision makers, sometimes intermediary influences on the decisions and lots of diverse needs there that you have to meet through the experience. Um, so a lot of complexity and understanding and meeting the needs across that ecosystem of users. Yeah, 100%, Kristen. I mean, the, when you speak to an individual, the CEO, CFO, and CEO all share a common brain. Uh, whereas <laughs> when you work with a company, they may be time zones apart and with their own calendars. And you know, as a result, as we all know, sales cycles can be so long as a result. There's so many different competing priorities you have to, that you might not even know about, that you are trying to empower your ambassador within that company to have those conversations with and address, et cetera. So just so, so exponentially more challenging than a D2C touch point, so to speak. Yeah, Mike, I think you bring a great point of um, empowering people to sell on your behalf within the organization since the cycle is so long that um, when you're thinking about your B2B strategy, it is like a different marketing and communication almost internally, as well as uh, the external factors. Yeah, and I would probably close this out maybe by adding that I think one of the other pieces you talk about those long sales cycles on the consumer side, it, it requires your experience to be much more agile, much more responsive, um, because you can, it's pretty, it's frictionless to leave and to join. And so you have to make sure that you're really reacting real time on that B2B side, you know, in, in our own industry that I operate in, average contract length is three years. And sometimes your sales cycle can be two to three years. And so it's a much longer dance, I, I would say, to get down that realm. So you've got opportunity to, to maybe not have such a swift adjustment. It's actually a great transition into um, the next question, which is, what are some of the things that we consider to be key principles in maintaining a competitive edge in the B2B landscape throughout each of those stages, the sales process, customer retainment, and, and, and others? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll kick us off on that. I think, you know, when you talk about that B2B landscape, you have to make sure you're addressing in that kind of early stage when you're in the buyer persona stage, all of those different personas, and you really have to address what those needs are. Um, in some cases, the stakeholders for purchase can be pretty broad, an entire committee of you know, 10 to 20 people in some instances, and you really have to understand those unique needs and really address it in kind of a longer scale way. Um, and then as you close a deal and you bring them into that kind of the customer journey, when you're thinking about onboarding and adoption and even have that upsell expansion space, I would say it's just as critical that you keep those same types of personas engaged. You really can't take your eye off the prize when it comes to that level of commitment. Hmm. Interesting. Michael, any thoughts from your end on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm in full agreement with Candace. It's the value proposition, whatever that benefit is that one the deal, I mean, you have to really nail that. And you also have to remind the customer of it. Uh, so they understand that it's being realized. Um, and as much as possible, start building, uh, as my CMO back at MasterCard used to always say, uh, build a moat around your brand and around that customer relationship that's like impregnable. You know, you, you, you want to create like frictionless experiences, fully realized value propositions and benefits. And that's just 
so important. And that takes really human effort to, mm -hmm. to make that, make sure that's realized by your client because people are busy. They get focused on other things, especially after a deal goes through or an implementation happens, whatever that might look like. Um, people move on to the next priority that that's on fire in their inbox. And, and you have to have processes on your side that make sure you, you bring that to bear and make that visible uh, to the, the folks you're serving. Yeah, Michael, I, that, if I can jump in, I think you're spot on there. I mean, it, it's uh, because the B2B is such a long sell cycle, it does take a relationship. A lot of times the reason why um, a brand may have bought your product and, and pr priorities may change, you know, use cases may change, um, or even people within the organization that's even implementing it, you know, may change and and not having some type of um, reoccurring checkpoint or QBR around like, are you getting value out of what you purchase in, in this relationship? It, it's almost a, a necessity to um, to build that one, the trust with you as a partner, but then also to understand the brand's uh, vision of why they're actually uh, in this relationship with you. It's kind of threading the needle. Potentially. Yeah, go ahead, Kristen. I was just going to say two builds potentially to, to close us out on this one. I think one would be for those decision makers. The reason why the sales cycle in these spaces are so long is because these are significant decisions on behalf of these organizations. So I love the ideas, agree wholeheartedly with how are you demonstrating the outcomes that you are driving for them in their organization through the course of the relationship and make it really easy for them to tell that story to their committees, to their boss, um, to show and reinforce over time, no, you made the right decision and here's why. Let's show the tangible benefit that you were getting as a result. The other piece I think is to not forget about some of those day-to-day -day type of contacts. I know we have a lot of day-to-day -day operational administrative contacts in our business. And their experience might not be the reason we're winning or losing business, but their pain points can surface really quickly to, to that committee if they're not addressed. So helping to ensure that those experiences too are incredibly easy and effective and positive uh, is really important for the ongoing relationship. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's, there's something to be said about building a strong org that can operate in that agile manner that Candace was talking about, but still um, change and adapt the narrative for each individual customer at the individual parts of the journey that they're in. Um, Kristen, I'm curious how you navigate the differences when building out retention and engagement for B2B customers versus retail customers. Yeah, so I would say uh, it starts with understanding those personas. So who are the various types of users that we have, the various constituents that we have, both within the decision makers, those administrators, and influencers on the decisions. Uh, so I would say the complexity of that, the complexity of mapping out each of those persona journeys, mapping out where their pain points are, not that it's a different process than we would use in our retail space, but the complexity and the variation within that looks a bit different. I would also say that we rely heavily on both qualitative and quantitative in understanding that. I think a difference that I see in, in B2B versus B2C is, is the numbers. You know, in, in the retirement business that we operate in, we are in one way or another serving 15 million B2C participants. So those folks on the other end of the retirement plan, that's 3,000 clients. So just the scale that you're able to get through some of the quant type of insights, especially when you break it down by role, it's really critical to have a strong, robust, qualitative feedback mechanism to enrich those personas and journeys. When your teams are building out the personas, is that on a sort of an industry level or do you go client by client, really understand the unique aspects of their business and create those artifacts on a case by case basis? For us, we look at where the differences are. So as we dive in, we see a lot of differences, mostly by role. In some spaces, we'll, we'll see nuances by industry, but the largest ones tend to be by role in, in our business and industry playing less of an upfront indicator. Gotcha. Excellent. But I know that may differ by the, the types of businesses across this table. Yeah, I'm curious how some of our other panelists address that. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think for us, we like 
Similar, as Kristen mentioned, we have kind of those key personas that we're always taking a look at as part of that journey. Um, and we also make that at a very tactical level requirements when we think about our teams and how they manage like key contacts across personas so we don't lose sight of that. Um, but when it comes to the customer journey, we really like to make sure you're thinking about it. We like to align a lot to our customer segmentation, which really when we think about post sales is lined up to how do we service these accounts and what are those key differentiators? And a lot of times, even within our business, we include some of those buyer persona tendencies as well as administrator tendencies in how we segment customers. For example, if there's a type of product you sell that's maybe more toward a service line versus a full enterprise business, then that service model is gonna change and your personas are gonna change a little bit. And so you have to build that in and really think about it because how you segment and engage will also tie really closely to those, those service line levels. But I would say for us, it's much more around what makes them similar and where are those differences and that's kind of where we break it off. When working on the development of those, those um, personas, what is the interplay between marketing teams to help inform strategies as we're getting that out into the, the general marketplace? and product development teams so that they can make sure that they're creating services and solutions which are relevant across each of those personas that we've created. Critical, I would say like it, you know, that collaboration is really important, especially because the way your marketing team is engaging with, with buyers in the market is the same way you're engaging with them post-sale. It's all about that value-based purchasing and value realization. On the product side, it's really critical that they keep an eye to your personas and your segmentation because when you work in a world of design thinking or empowered teams, you wanna make sure you're getting those software development teams in front of all of those different types of personas and segments so that you're building product that meets the unique needs of your customer or your consumer base. Yeah, it's really solid, Candice. I think um, our approach and, and what we got uh, clients on as well is that like you have to have a holistic uh, listening strategy around either product launch or, or product or service engagement where you're not just listening to um, the app mentions where people are talking directly to you, uh, but overall, like what are they saying about your product in general? And a lot of those insights where if you have a workflow that can take um, the friction of like what they don't like about your product and quickly get that to the product team for an enhancement and improvement, uh, then you can take advantage of that. Uh, and then on the flip side of people that are really excited about an element of this product or service, get that to the marketing team. And so now they can create new creative and new uh, engagement opportunities based on what people say they like about, you know, this product or service. So um, that that's how we've we've choose to approach it of 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 uh, in trying to ensure success on both ends of of uh, the feedback. Vincent, I really love that. I'm curious about the listening component. Um, how do you double click into that? What types of services do your teams employ? Services, platforms, software, so that they can capture those insights from the customers either directly or just more organically throughout the marketplace. Well, I mean, it would be very um, self-serving to say Sprinkler offers these types of services, but, you know, AI listening at scale, I think is, um, is what you need to do. And regardless of like which platform partner you choose to, um, um, to do that I, with, you have to have a plan in place of like, if you get the best bit of data today, like what happens, like how does it get through your organization uh, to make it actionable? And I think that side of the equation is uh, it's probably more important than um, like your platform partners uh, that allow you to do it. Like you can, you can proof that out and, and see where the value is. Uh, but then again, the scenario we use, if the best bit of data came today, what happens? How many people have to approve it? Where does it go? Who can act on it? And how soon can you get that through your organization is, is really where the, the true value lies. Yeah, I think it's the combination of inputs across there as well, right? So it's looking at what's the behavior where we can see where clients are having difficulty or making progress through the experience. What is that telling us? Right. Having right. surveys within the experience to capture their perspective in those moments. And what does that tell us? How can we get feedback on a regular basis through our client teams, folks who are interacting 
one-on-one -on -one or group to group with those clients and what is that telling us and then we have a group of clients that we talk to on a regular basis to help inform our product mm -hmm. development um, so both in understanding their needs but then co-creating with us as we look to meet those needs yeah, one hundred percent. I, 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 you know, you, you want that the, the sort of external listening platform is great for just mass scale data, but I, I still am a big believer in the focus group approach, both with clients and even if you have the budget and the time for it. To there's so many agencies that will reach out to you know five, ten, twenty individuals that meet your persona profile and have a deep thirty, sixty minute discussion with them to dive into some of these deep questions, because there's so much about the journeys that we build that are theoretical at the outset as marketers, you know, we only know so much. Our sales are the front line and can and paint that picture more deeply, but you still need to get insight into what's invisible to us, to us which is those day-to-day -day challenges that clients face. And, you know, walking a Xerox <laughs> from one desk to another, that's, that's old school, but like, you know, sending an email and what challenges does that offer? And how do I present this issue to my boss so they are on board with what I'm recommending? These kinds of things are just, you just don't know that until you've really had a chance to dive deep with a, a couple layers down, almost like a black belt operations approach to how many so what's can I ask to get at the true insight that's at the root of it all. So when you combine those three things, sales insight, social listening insight, and you know, digital insight, and, and just deep dive insight, I think you can have something that's really robust that you can get behind uh, to be the place where honestly... You start, but then you prioritize based on revenue impact potential and, and get aligned with products uh, to decide what you're going to move on next. I love that. And Michael, I would probably add to, I know, Kristen, you mentioned the phrase behavioral, but I think there's a lot of information that people tell us, you know, and I think we all know that surveying is something mm -hmm. that we do pretty comprehensively because it's easy to work with. Um, but a lot of times when you're thinking about technologies, if you have tools that provide really good product telemetry, um, because what people tell you and what they actually do are sometimes <laughs> in pretty interesting conflict with one another. Right. Um, so I always want to make sure we tell folks, get a good balance on that, especially on the B2B side, because you tend to have a really captive audience leveraging your products. And so you can really see those details that may tell you a different story. So make sure you marry both of those together. This is a really interesting topic. I want to double click in here a little bit more. How do we make sure that we're building out orgs that can action against the data rapidly so that we're not getting insights about our customers <clears throat> and that it takes us two, three, maybe six months to actually turn that around into an improved end user or customer experience. Yeah, I would say with something like that, it's it's those really like old, very practical things like racy models and responsibility. And when you think about who truly owns the action, I think that's the part that gets missed a lot in a business. Everybody looks at the data. It's great. What do we do with it is usually that missing piece. And so you really have to think within your business who owns that and what are the commitments when it comes to integrating in like high volume elements into your product teams. And so that, that comes with organizational alignment, I think, a lot of times at the executive level to make sure that you can meet those commitments. Do you see that as being a new paradigm for org design as we move into 2023 and all of the promises of data and AI and ML? Yes, yeah. I would say, you know, I think it, it's always important that, especially with the transformation that's happening, I mean, I think chat GPT, for example, has thrown everyone for kind of a a tailspin, I would say, of just how you manage data and how you leverage some of these pieces. And, you know, it's making everyone rethink or design and what the role of data is within it. And I, I think there's never a bad time to look at your org design and see if it meets the needs of what the market is now demanding of you because it's shifting pretty rapidly. And I think whether it's also org design or otherwise, I think the importance of cross-functional collaboration with clarity of roles. I agree wholeheartedly, Candace. Um, but having the folks at the table who can bring those different perspectives that can bring those various areas of expertise, you know, in our teams, we're looking at who are our journey owners who are designing the end-to-end -end optimal experience, our product owners who are going to bring that into the various products that we oversee, our user researchers, our data analysts to bring those insights, the rest of our UX team. I think having that tight team connection can help ensure that one, people understand what all of those insights are telling us and two, that you have the right people to figure out how this plays in to actions in various ways. 
Yeah, one of the things that we found at Kraft Heinz is we're sort of undergoing this this digital transformation journey is not just filling those roles because, um, as you mentioned, Kristen, we've got some of the same positions that we're integrating into the org, data analysts, uh, user researchers, and so on, but where they fit within the context of the product development lifecycle so yeah. that those insights can be actioned against and built into the otherwise natural rhythms of the teams. Um, yeah, you're so spot on. Not, it's, oh, go I was going to say you're spot on. It's definitely a, a difference between like optimizing current workflows and actually moving into like a, a digital transformation of how you how your teams operate. So definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But let's yeah. zoom out a bit. Um, we know it's important to understand what our customers, uh, sorry, who our customers are, how the products, services, and solutions address their specific pain points. Candice, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of understanding the customer journey and the benefit that that can play when building out the customer strategy itself. Now we've been talking about this kind of at the high level, but let's go deep on this one. And is it an individualized approach or is it just sort of at a product or portfolio level? Yeah, so I would say for, for our organization, it's a little bit in between. And so when we think about those customer journeys, we, we align them to our segmentation model, which does include some of those persona and kind of buyer elements. Um, and then within that model, we are creating unique experiences for each persona at every segment level. Um, and so, you know, depending on how you segment your customer base B2B, that may change for you. You may not include some of those personas and how you already structure it. You may have to take it a layer deeper. Um, but for us, the probably the most central facet, and we talked about this a little bit earlier on, is around customer value, the reason for purchase. And I think it's really important that when you understand why someone purchases, we put them on almost like digital experience campaigns that are constantly reinforcing that. When you're in an enterprise space that's very high touch, we still have digital in play, but I would say when you think about a long tail, so those of you who are maybe a little bit like Relias, where you have a lot of small business customers, you have to be able to do that at scale. And that comes from persona-based, segment-based, um, value-based experiences that are constantly helping them achieve that value. Um, and you have to have telemetry in place when you see that going off the rails so that you can engage a lot more proactively. So um, I would say for us, it, it goes a few levels deep, um, but no matter what, I would put on the on the B2B side value and kind of reason for purchase and outcomes has to be a very central facet for you. Michael, what are your thoughts here? Uh, that's a great answer. I almost need you to repeat the question, Andrew. <laughs> all, all good, all good. So the, the question is just about the importance of understanding the customer journey and the benefit that that can play when building out the customer strategy. So do we go at the individual level or do we look at our internal platform at, at kind of the portfolio lens, through the portfolio lens and build sort of a more or less, I'll do air quotes here, but one size fits all solution. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I think we'll all agree there is no one size fits all solution in most cases. It, it's so dependent on the role, the growth stage of the company, what stage they're at in terms of maturity. Um, you know, are, are they global, et cetera? In, in our case, for example, you know, we work with uh, bootstrapped startups, we work with venture funded unicorns and growth stage companies, and we work with post IPO corporates that all have vastly different needs, right? Uh, on, on the one hand, you might have a CEO who's also the CFO and CEO, and when they're venture funded, suddenly they're flush with cash and have are trying to accelerate their growth and they now have a finance team. Uh, with a corporate, you might have a very mature company who has uh, shareholders to respond to. So the, the, the financial solutions that they all need differ uh, incredibly. Um, so the journey that, that we build for each uh, varies quite a bit. And it really, we, we try to look at uh, the pain points that matter and the moments that matter, um, especially at key inflection points of growth stage. Uh, you know, when a, when a startup, for example, is suddenly funded, wow, that's a whole new door that's open to a whole new realm of uh, both opportunity and pain that we want to be first and foremost ready to help and address and serve. Um, so 100%, it's, it's, it is developing that persona, understanding the challenges and pain points, understanding what's happening with that organization and building a journey that responds to that, um, you know, empathetically. Amazing. 
Vincent, I'm curious from your standpoint, <clears throat> when we think about the role that personas play, um, Candace gave us some uh, kind of an outline of, of how her teams are using them um, within the strategic blueprinting stages. Mm -hmm. What are the components of a strong persona? There's obviously personas, there's behavioral archetypes that we use within the experience design realm. Um, how do you think about those? Is there a direct crossover between a B2B persona and a marketing persona? And, and, and just kind of help us understand the way that the teams build those. Well, for our teams, and, and when as from uh, if I take it from a marketing angle and how we would approach it, um, say like for a brand like Amazon, we will look at the persona for a client when we were um, developing a campaign for um, Echo devices, let's say for example. And so that we know within that persona, there's people that were um, smart home enthusiasts that would, uh, would be attracted by a certain line of content. Uh, there will be music lovers that will be attracted by a certain line of content. Uh, there will be uh, det detractors that were concerned about, you know, security uh, concerns around the device itself. So as we uh, developed our engagement campaign, then we leveraged those personas to, to literally address the users where they were in that journey. And, and so um, so that's the mindset that, that we've always taken the approach of how do we leverage personas, how do we build them out? Um, it's it's not going to be the same journey for each. And even for one persona, if you take them all the way through awareness to advocacy, there's different um, levels of communication uh, that you want to have with them at every stage of the journey. So part of that is, you know, awareness and listening, but then part of that is have having the um, marketing flexibility to, to say, I uh, I know I need this message at this time for this particular persona, if that makes sense. Absolutely. It's great. Kristen, any thoughts on your end? Yeah, I, I think there's incredible power in the combination of the two themes that we're talking about, the looking at the client experience strategy through the lens of the client journey and the application of these personas. So as we think about you know, a customer journey like onboarding, one, it's critically important to approach that strategy by understanding what's that end-to-end -end experience from the client's perspective and how can we improve that across human touch points, digital touch points, operational processes across the board, whereas in years past, it was more optimizing touch point by touch point. But then I think the added layer of what do those journeys look like by persona enriches the strategy that much more. So in our space, the onboarding journeys for a human resources executive are going to look different than those of the day-to-day -day administrators who are running their retirement plans, those in our treasury and investment departments, um, and then the consultants who might be influencing the decision-making. So understanding that just allows us to better understand and meet the needs through this client experience strategy. Amazing. So we know that throughout the journey, we have the journey that we're creating as uh, providers. And then we have the journey that our, our potential clients and customers are going through as well. Um, some obviously more successful than others at given points throughout that journey. One of the questions that just came in, which I think is particularly relevant to this part of the conversation is, how do we identify at-risk customers and what actions are we taking to retain them? Um, is it software, there's solutions, or is it just sort of organic one-on-one -on -one conversations that we're we're using to to highlight that, and then uh, how do we re-engage? Um, Kristen, would you mind kicking us off there? Sure. So I think the first part is to understanding what the drivers are of being at risk, and I think learning from recent past experience can can really help shape what those drivers might be. Is it turnover in decision maker um, at the organization? What are the other factors at play? Are there service issues? Uh, and then using that to create a dashboard of, of sorts in terms of who are at risk and how can we mitigate those various risks through leaning into the relationship and applying particular attention to the areas that need to be resolved. Amazing. Awesome. Maybe I'll jump in as well. I think with the risk programs, it depends on kind of where you are in your your maturity. I think as a business, you know, I remember when we first started as a startup, as a company, 
a lot of our risk factors were just things that people that were close to customers said, if this doesn't happen, they're at risk. And we, we started building our model off of that. So if you're at that early stage where you're like, where do I start? I don't have the resources. Oftentimes the experts that work with your customers are the ones who can give you that foundation that you can then turn into data and things that you track. Um, as you get much more complex on it, I mean, now we have a full data science team that runs an AI based, you know, um, data model of risk that flags accounts based on a whole variety of data elements. Um, that's the beauty of having a massive amount of data, whether it's product data, service data, financial data, because all together, that's where you start to see those trends. A lot of times things you would have never thought of. Um, so I would say you can start really simple and be really effective. And as you grow over time, there's a lot of technologies or resources that can really help you amplify and be really, really predictive with risk. And that level of prediction is where you can think about where do I put my resources? You know, a lot of us, are, our team members are some of our most costly resources. We don't have enough of them. Um, and so how do you want to leverage those types of resources? Use that kind of risk data to help you think about where do you engage? Where do you enhance the experience digitally where you can do it maybe more at scale? But that's really how, how we think about it at Relias. Yeah, it's spot on, Candice. I mean, I love the, like you said, there's several um, like utilization data points that you can, uh, that can become predictors of uh, of churn risk or 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 just a lack uh, lack of education with a product you know uh, that you can definitely get it and then we also look at uh, your call center your customer service center so there's so much data that comes through there around um, friction points that people have with the product or service that you can easily begin to see norms and trends of. Um, it may not be a product flaw, but it may be an education flaw that now we need to weave back into our go-to-market approach or our ongoing relationship with the client. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's a, I, that's so important. Oh, go sorry. ahead, Michael. So I, I just want to jump on what you just said. Utilization, right? Unrealized value that perhaps your solution already offers and the client just isn't using. Like that's so important. Um, because it's easy to sometimes read the data and read the reactions, read your NPS scores that only reflect what the client is feeling with regards to what they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and there's absolutely that challenge about unrealized value that just might not be recognized yet. We talked a little bit about that at the, at the beginning of, of the session, where it's like reminding them of the original value prop uh, that brought them in and how to realize it and how to get there and you know deliver on the promise on your own behalf, how important that can be. Um, so I really love that. That's a great point that sometimes I think uh, some organizations forget about. Yeah, and I think having access to that data too, requiring an org to have that feedback loop built into their ways of working so that we have teams who can analyze it, propose recommendations or optimizations, and then build it into the actual product. Super important there as well. Um, let's pivot a little bit. I know we're, we're, we're making good progress here, but Obviously, this is a bit of a Pandora's box we're about to open up, but there's a ton of buzz over the past few months surrounding generative AI, different types of chat capabilities. Open question for the group. How do we see these technologies transforming the customer experience, and how do we start testing them out in a responsible way in the real-world environment without running the risk of creating thrash with our customers through unintended consequences? Maybe I'll jump in first. Um, I think I always say like there's so much room for this. I think we've seen it grow over the years, but you have to be really responsible with it. So some of the ways I've seen a lot of companies think about dipping their toe in the generative AI space first is to leverage the technology to support their staff who are supporting customers. Um, mm -hmm. So you've still got that kind of catch point. That's a really safe way to allow the data to help you before you think about unleashing it for your customers. I think the benefit of having elements that are out there directly at the hands of a customer and letting them work with it is that you are handling a huge volume of engagement with your customers, but there is risk in that. And so I always say like that kind of blanket approach, similar to the same way we think about customer experience, everyone is different and your data models are only as good as what you train them on, um, the data sets that they have available. And so you have to be really careful to not expect some kind of technology to come in and be your white knight on something that's not even data that you really have a massive amount of. So you have to be really thoughtful of, 
where is the specific place where I know I have enough data that this could be managed pretty effectively. And so I would say be very judicious with it. Yeah. I, I love the idea of starting with an oh. I love ahead, the idea of starting with an internal audience first as a as a really purposeful way to dip the toe in the water. The other thing I would say is to guard against being a solution seeking a problem. You know, make sure that you're starting with what are the client or internal employee problems that need to be solved and how can these new technologies help inform the design of that solution um, mm -hmm. and, and not the reverse, which I often see with new technologies becoming the case. How can we leverage this shiny new object in an exciting way versus here's the client need and here's how this can help. Yeah, I you know I was I was going to add the the two big impacts I see are I mean first of all uh, AI will be incorporated in your tech stack that you already use today you know whether that's Word and PowerPoint or you know uh, or uh, Sprinkler itself you know um, th this tech stack elements that already have massive amounts of data being fed into it because they cross so many client categories and industries mm -hmm. that's where like the value of AI will be realized uh, not all of us some of us will. Um, have a massive amount of data that might feed AI within our own solutions of products, but that's kind of rare. Um, that's probably not going to be us, SVB. I don't know if it'll be Candace's team. Might be Vanguard with millions of customers, a Sprinkler for sure. Mm -hmm. But in other words, I, I see AI really showing up in your Martech stack. Um, and what that means then is that's yet another feature that your internal team is going to learn how to, how to use, right? Because there's so many bells and whistles and very few people within an organization know how to use all of it. That's just a constant challenge. Um, so, uh, but for sure, the impact to CX will be everything's going to be faster. Everything's going to be more responsive. Um, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, clients, B2B clients will just be expecting better and better experiences. And it's just going to be more competitive because of the pace of acceleration that AI will bring about. So yeah. Martech yeah. stack acceleration, internal teams need to learn it, and clients expecting more from you. <laughs> that is spot on, Michael. It's so funny. I mean, that you're, the expectation will, has definitely risen. So it doesn't matter if, um, you know, people want a Disney experience with my bank, right? You know, and so it's like, it, it doesn't matter what what industry it is, um, just that immediacy of, of knowledge and then um, the desire to have a brand know and understand where you are in their process, uh, it's going to be just cross-functional uh, no matter who you're dealing with. So, Amazing. Um, exciting to see what 2023 is going to hold for us. So let's take another step back. Um, now that we have a better understanding of some of the complexities in the B2B and then throughout the B2B landscape, let's talk about how to build a team to create that unforgettable customer relationship. Another open question for the group, what types of roles and discipline do you hire for when building out this part of your org? I know we talked a little bit about UX designers, data, um, uh, data analysts, and so on, but with a little bit more detail, what, is this, what does this new team look like? Well, I'll start. I, I think, um, you know, for us, again, we, we, if you look at all the platforms and the tools and things, I mean, and again, they are just a... Um, they are tools that empower whatever your business goals and missions are, right? And so for us, we've always just taken a, a step back to say, like, what, what are we looking to accomplish as a brand? And then we will find, you know, the, the platform or the or the players that will align to it. But I think you, you just have to have clear understanding of the goals and the whys of what you're looking to accomplish. And then you can begin to... Um, to to find the players that that can plug into your team. Excellent. You know, I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I think you you ideally, philosophically, you would want your org to have like three core elements that come to my mind are um, empathy, data, and design. So you, you need somebody who can like walk around in the shoes of the client that they're trying to serve. You need to, and that's that's the empathy side. You need the data analyst or team that can take the discernible single signals and formulate a hypothesis around how, you know, how do we make that person's pain better or go away and serve it. Um, and then you need design, which is like how do we design that experience that uh, you know very tactically in, in in the form of digital and physical uh, components 
that help serve that, whether that's product design, whether that's experience design at, a, at an event or visiting your website, et cetera. So the team that you'd have to build would be, I mean, you need some an analyst or an analyst team. You need uh, the research and customer facing organization that may be your, your sales and uh, customer success team. And then your design is really like, th those are your web developers, marketers, creatives, brand folks. You know, it's a combination of those and will vary vastly depending on the size of your org, but you really need those three elements covered, I think, to do that really well. Yeah, I think that's well summarized. I love that. Excellent. And I'd probably add, you know, with a group that's very on the B2B side, I have found that parts of my team, as we get more focused on data and experience, they start to look a little bit like parts of your own marketing organization. So you see individuals who have skill sets that really, really relate. And the same thing goes for your consumer business. So we have both. And I would say, as we have focused much more on customer experience on the B2B side, we have been looking for consumer experience and experts to come into that space to help us think about how we affect folks at scale. Um, and within my own organization, I put kind of the strategy for our different segments and how we engage on the leaders in my customer success organization and we operationalize it inside of our operations team within the business. Um, and you see great new roles emerge like in customer success, actually having a program manager who can own digital strategy for you for a customer segment, which is really great career pathing as you kind of make that transformation for your business. Love it. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. This has been such an interesting debate. Um, Brittany, I know that uh, you've got some closing thoughts here as well, and I think we have a little bit more time for Q&A, um, but Brittany, over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for such an insightful panel discussion. We we're actually at time, so we do have to wrap up, but I do want to thank you again. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this fantastic session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Thank you all so much again.